Um, so talk about then, let's back up and talk a little bit about, um, go back to your algorithm and your AI and how that had an impact on the uh, private jet travel space today and maybe a little bit about who's working with that algorithm. So when I left EBS, I spent a year burning off non-competes with Nortel and then went right back into telecom. And our first um, client that signed up, now called CenturyLink, back then they were called Quest, um, asked us to route phone calls as the phones were ringing. And first of all, um, I correctly judged that the cost of compute would go down and their volumes would go up. So the curves would, you know, separate. And so I priced the product at 30% over cost and just bet on the future. And X price teaches you to bet on the future and understand the pace of technology. So it was a safe bet, but it was still a bet. And it worked. Um, their volume skyrocketed to where we were dealing with 100 million phone calls in a busy hour, routing them as the phone's ringing, 14 billion calls a month on a software as a service basis, uh, 0.000027 cents per message. But it adds up when you do a half trillion of them. And that gave me a company with 68% EBITDA and put us on the Inc. 500, which gave me the dollars to then take that AI and do something more real world with it. Routing phone calls is kind of virtual. All right, long distance gets cheaper, but you don't really see the product. The product is kind of the phone bill. Maybe the quality of service, that was one of our determinants. Yeah. But routing phone calls is also enormously complex. There's a patchwork of phone companies. If you want to make an international call, you have many trading partners, lots of tariffs. Actually, it's a much more complex problem than routing airplanes. Yet on the board of Coastal Technologies was Peter Diamandis, pilot, myself, pilot, and we're thinking, what else can you do with high-speed routing? And of course, the answer is private aviation. At that time, private aviation was broken. People were selling empty legs. They're flying 40% empty. And I spent five years teaching that AI to deal with the complexities of aviation. So crew arrest, maintenance, moving a plane towards maintenance, but still putting revenue flights on it. All these things that could chip away at efficiency. And then we spent the next five years getting carriers to trade flights. So we ended up by design and by foregone conclusion, focusing on carriers that were white label that would carry for other people. Those are the carriers that were willing to trade flights. Okay. So the argument went something like this, rather than sell your empty legs, which pins your network two days in the future, and if the revenue trip cancels or something breaks, you still have to reposition to go get that empty leg that you sold at a discount. It's disastrous for the carrier. Rather than do that, let us dynamically re-optimize your network as requests come in, as planes break, as the weather changes in a way that's never been done before because we took this monster from telecom routing, 100 million things an hour versus 10,000 a day. It's, yeah, it's just yeah. you know orders of magnitude difference. By the way, 480 cores running on supercomputers, that's my actual core strength, distributing a problem across supercomputers. Wow. Um, so this changed the industry. So let me si highlight JetSmarter as an example. Okay. JetSmarter is a company that bought empty lights from one of my clients, Travel Management, and sold them. They were brilliant at creating demand. They were brilliant at having an app that would let you book, but they had no infrastructure behind them. They didn't have a fleet and they were dependent on empty legs. Well, when the source of empty legs dried up, they went from north of a billion dollar valuation to being liquidated for 20 million in equity, no cash. One of our other clients bought them. Okay. So that's that's the disruption that we're talking about. That AI changes a broken industry. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy and it's gonna be great to see that application of it. So before we go further on that, uh, during this time, you've been spending a lot of time flying yourself as well. You've got a Cirrus SR22. What year model is it? It is a Centennial. It's uh, the same model that one of the Klapmeyer brothers had as their personal ride. There you um, go. All right, so side story here. Uh -huh. I was flying the Centennial SR22 and my company Coastal helped sponsor the uh, Kitty Hawk celebration, the Centennial flight celebration. Okay. And if you set a speed record in the Centennial year, Scott Crossfield signed your certificate. Wow and I was flying the official plane of the celebration. I can send you a picture of that Centennial SR-22 parked in front of the Wright Monument. 
So all that screamed set a speed record. And so I have, my first record was Palm Beach to Kitty Hawk. Okay. That was so much fun. I ended up setting additional point to point records, which are not that challenging. In fact, there was no Palm Beach to Kitty Hawk record. It was easy to set. <laughs> but then I, I went on to uh, set the three kilometer low altitude. That's the record previously held by Amelia Earhart and Wiley Post. Okay. When you're setting classic speed records, it's the French that administer that and the French that originally set them or recorded them. They did that with high speed cameras on the ground. So you have to basically do your record attempt at 50 feet over a highway. We closed down a highway. I'm oh. below billboards. I had an NAA observer on board and I'm flying figure eights at 50 feet. So my first practice run at this, I then returned to the airport after a successful run, popped up to pattern altitude and they said, Richard, you just busted your record. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, Richard, you can't climb to a thousand feet in your turboprop. You need to stay at 50 feet. It was, <laughs> you know, or whatever ceiling it was, it was um, an eye-opening experience. Well, that's crazy, and that's not something I know much about. So for people that don't know much about setting uh, aviation records and where you would even find those records, you mentioned the French, but talk a little bit. Let's just say I wanted to go out and and uh, find an aviation record that might be within reach of breaking and resetting. Where would I find that? How, how does that process work? What do you do? So the Federation Aeronautique International is the governing body and the u.s organization is the um, naa okay. so you join the naa and you join the fai and for the point to point records that's pretty straightforward they have a database look up you can look it up many airline crews hold records like that because they're the first to try between a, a city pair a verijet which we'll talk about later will be setting some of these but when it's a technical record i would advise talking to an naa advisor an NAA board member, really, and they'll end up flying with you because you need observers. Okay. Um, back when I did my last records, you had a very expensive, enormous GPS that was highly precise. I think Boss might fix that now, but back then it was a monster and you had your own localizer receivers on at your local airport. Okay. And that gave them the precision to administer the records. So the technical ones, which require time and effort and dollars and application, um, you definitely want to talk to an NAA board member and get help. Okay. The others okay. are mostly an exercise in paperwork. You can go them uh, VOR to VOR. You get air traffic control to help certify the record. And here in comes another story. Okay. So I bought a turboprop and was bringing it across the North Atlantic and wanted to set a record from Tarb, France, the factory to Hollywood, North Perry. And I also wanted to get an RVSM certification. And at that time you had to fly over a transponder at Atlantic City. And I'm with a ferry pilot, Margaret Waltz, an amazing lady. We were on her 600th Atlantic crossing. Everywhere we landed, they threw a party. We met a descendant of Eric the Red in Iceland. The Scottish brought us shortbread cookies and the constable, I mean, it was great. <laughs> we, we landed in Pennsylvania, they're like, Hi, Margaret, we'll do the paperwork tomorrow. I have never seen anything like it. I can't come back from the Bahamas without <laughs> you know, enormous reams of paperwork. Margaret lands and they know her and she's bringing a plane that's never before in the US and it's, hi, Margaret, we'll see you tomorrow. Um, it, in all of this, we're trying to set this record crossing the beacon in Atlantic City. And because we're setting a record, ATC gave us priority. And there was a 747 queued up behind us. Wow. And ATC explained, you know, they're setting a record. We're going to let them go first. And so we cross the beacon, they cross the beacon, then they pass us. And they get <laughs> on the radio and they go, they're setting a speed record. We passed them like they're going backwards. And Margaret gets on the radio and goes, shut down three of your engines and see how fast you go. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, I love that woman. I hope she's out there flying safe and having a great time. Where does she live? Pennsylvania. Okay. Maybe she'll see this video. We'd love to Love to meet her. Oh. That would be great. So she would be the most amazing guest ever. Forget me. Go find Margaret Walsh. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's do. We'll have to do that yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because one of the things we're doing at CoFlight is, just, you know, we really just want to promote aviation and ownership, right? So we're talking to different pilots with different experiences. We've got some of that, and this would be great. And then we'll go from there. And by the way, Richard, we really appreciate you being on the board of CoFlight. You've been a great help to us and provided insight. So that's been been fun, and we look forward to a bright future there as well. Oh, it's, it's a great company. You're going to 
not only save the people some, some headache, but you may even save some lives. And it really addresses a, a need in private aviation and 135 that we'll talk about. So it's a, it's a great company, I'm proud to be part of it. Absolutely, so appreciate that. So, all right, so let's talk about Verjet. So basically we've talked a little bit about your background, but, but before we do that, I've got one more question on this, uh, yes, on the records. Because, yeah. okay, so you flew an SR-22 from Palm Beach to Kitty Hawk, Kitty, West Palm Beach to Kitty Hawk. Right. And uh, set a record, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's to prevent the next SR-22 that's a little bit faster from coming to break in the hole? Is it a different record? I mean... No, it's, it would be the same could, record. Anybody could go up there and do that, right? Absolutely, for that weight class. Now, okay. for some reason, I still hold all seven. No one's bothered to break them yet. The three kilometer is a, a prime target. Um, there are faster turboprops now that you could set that record in. Okay.